This is our last lesson. I actually thought like a week or so ago that we had two left uh, and I was going to do God is love and then I was going to sort of wrap it all up next week. So I'm trying to wrap it all up. I'm trying to do the lesson as well as wrap it all up um, with really an encouragement to all of us to really seek after God, seek after the knowledge of him and uh, to grow in him. And that's why we have the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards, just to give you a snapshot of one man's desire and heart to grow in God. Uh, so we will finish uh, this term with this lesson seven, God is love. I hope it's been a blessing to you um, to really just uh, start to grow in your knowledge and love of God um, and to see how that will impact every part of our life. Uh, and then to let that then be a pursuit of your life, uh, to know him and, and love him all the more. So why don't I start and we'll, uh, well, I'll pray and then we'll get, get started. Lord, our God, uh, the one who is transcendent, uh, the one who is incomprehensible, inscrutable, you are God. And we stand uh, before that mighty God, that holy one. Uh, in a sense, on hallowed ground before our God. And we praise you and glorify you, Lord. And we're looking at a lesson today of the love of God or this um, aspect or attribute that permeates every other attribute uh, that is done from a heart of love and a love that is uh, greater than the stars, uh, deeper than hell, uh, as the songwriter speaks uh, and transcends time and space and culture uh, to bring the knowledge of God to us in the saving knowledge of Christ. Uh, Lord, may we be encouraged by the love that you bring to all humanity, but specifically to your people. Uh, grow us in this knowledge and love for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, just to start off, uh, have you ever heard the saying, and maybe you have said this, uh, when you go up to someone, an unsaved person, and you say, God loves you. Or you've had someone say to you, God loves you. And you're an unsaved person. And the question I want to put forward to you to start with is, is it right to say to someone, God loves you? Specifically after our lesson last week. Remember, we talked about the wrath of God. There didn't seem to be much love in that. Just seems to be pretty hard justice. But is it right to say to someone, God loves you? Um, or do you need to qualify that? Um, do you need to qualify God's love? And so we're going to look at this topic and try and help us understand that we can say to someone, God loves you, but does need to be qualified. And then what does the love of God mean for me if I am in Christ? There's three aspects. I thought, well, how will we divide the lesson up? There's three aspects of God's love that we want to look at. The first is God's love for himself. This will be really the basis of God's love for humanity and then God's love for his people. Uh, if God is not this, he cannot be this and he cannot be this. Um, so this is really the three aspects of God's love that we want to look up, look at this morning. Um, how are we going to define it? How are we going to analyze it? Well, we're going to do it this way. Um, and you've got your notes there. And so the first aspect that I want to uh, deal with is God's love for himself. Now, I think it was the second lesson maybe we did. We looked at the Trinity you remember the lesson, those who were part of that lesson, looking at the Trinity. Um, how is it, maybe you can help me here, or why is it important for our knowledge, or why is it important that we know about, or that God is in Trinity in order for him to be loving? Let me put it in a negative way. If God is not in Trinity, he really cannot love. Or we would not know if he loves. There would be something that might be uh, invisible to us. So why is God being in Trinity so important to the doctrine of or the attribute that God is loving? Maybe you can help me. And just I'm really reaching back now to our uh, lesson on the Trinity. Love is about relationships. And he's in a relationship in the Trinity. 
Right. Right. Yes, good, good. And if he wasn't that, it'd be hard for us to comprehend his love, wouldn't it? And then, so if you look then, thank you, Steve, that's, that's really good. He's in relationship within the Trinity, Father to Son, uh, Father to Spirit, Spirit to Son, Son to Father, in a self-giving, loving relationship in Trinity as one that makes him or shows forth his love. It is a loving relationship. In fact, do we say it? Um, I think we did say something along these lines. That, um, that true love is the absence of self. Or the absence of selfishness. True hell or true hate is total selfishness. Because you're just not engaged or not caring about other people. So if we think of love, it really is selfless. And that's what we see in the Trinity. It is a loving relationship that wants the best for the other person uh, in the Trinity. And I've got some verses here. Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved son, says the father. He loves his son. John 3, 35. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Don't you love that? The father holds nothing back from the son, loves the son, gives everything to the son. Why begin here? Because if we don't understand God's relationship to himself, then we will not understand God's relationship to humanity and specifically God's relationship uh, to his people. And that's what uh, differentiates uh, Allah to God, our God, Jehovah God. See, some might say, well, Allah really is just another name for God. Well, Allah's not, because what defines Allah? Look in the Quran and then you'll see the definition of what Allah is. What is, it? What is Allah's attributes? Um, he is one who has the ability to lie. He's one who has the ability to change his mind. Um, the Quran says. So that's not actually God. In fact, I'd hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it, but I would say what Allah defines more is Satan, not God, uh, when you look at the attributes of Allah. So just when you think of that, um, don't ever think that, hey, Muslim, we're worshipping sort of the same God here. You just got to worship him through Jesus Christ. Um, no, no, no. The God of um, Islam He's certainly not the God of the Bible and certainly not even well, not the God of the Old Testament, which they would hold to. So um, <clears throat> a good evangelistic approach is to define who God is from the Old Testament uh, for the Muslim, because they would hold the Old Testament to say, look at this God, look at his love. And then that will be ultimately found in the cross of Christ. Uh, so here we have. God's love for himself. Now, this love is not like our love. It doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't change. It is never withdrawn. Uh, it always pursues. It always hopes for the best. It seeks the best. It is a continuous love of God's whole self to the Trinity. All of him given over to the other persons of the Trinity whether it's to the Spirit, who just simply seeks to point to Christ, whether it's Jesus pointing to the Father, etc. Any questions on that, first of all, as we look at, and we're just going to move. Any thoughts? You understand that? So when we understand God's, God is love, we define it as, or see it, particularly as him being in relationship with himself in the Trinity. The second point is God's love for humanity. And we have a space there um, that love shown by common grace. So let me just put that in. Love shown by common grace. Now this is a, let's call this a general, general love, and we'll call this a specific love. Now what we're trying to do here We've got to let scripture dictate terms, okay? Because when we come to this wonderful characteristic of God's love, we want to define it ourselves, 
right? We, we want to put, or whether we want to put boundaries or release boundaries, we want to define it ourselves and what our heart wants to do. We don't want to do that. We want to let scripture dictate what this means of God. Okay, so if you are struggling with this, help bring your thoughts to scripture and let scripture dictate uh, what or define what God's love is. So how does he um, demonstrate his love? First of all, it is through his common grace to all humanity. Have a look at the verse here, Matthew 5, 45. And he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What does this mean? And how does that define his love as a general grace? Because even people who are outside his, the salvation that he's provided are given the common grace of a new day and yeah. the same thing we all get. Right, absolutely. Things happen to them for the good, in a sense. Even though they might snub their nose at God, even though they might seek to teach others that God doesn't exist, that God is whatever, hateful, etc. Um, but this love is indiscriminate. What, what it's really saying is God's love is so wonderful, it is indiscriminate. It just flows out from him. And that is seen in things such as rain, sun, uh, sending it to both. And when Paul went to the Athenians on Mars Hill, he used this concept to help them see that actually God is a loving God and is dispensing love to you. Don't be ignorant of this. He says this in Acts 14, 17, and we'll be looking at this passage very soon when we're going through our preaching series. And he didn't leave himself without witness. Now notice that, right? God's love is a witness in love, okay? He does it for a purpose. Didn't leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with, with food and gladness. Notice that in our heart, we, have, uh, we know we're guilty before God, but God uses all of the common grace as a witness of his love. Uh, the, the riches for us to enjoy, demonstrated in a planet that is full with things to enjoy. The second thing is that love seen in universal pity. Pity. So we see common grace, but then universal pity. Have a look here at these verses. Ezekiel 18.23. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Like, so when we're looking at God's grace last week, sorry, God's grace, God's wrath last week, this is... This is not born from a vindictive spirit, from a sadistic mind. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Verse 32. Have I no pleasure? Or, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. There is no glee found in God when hundreds of thousands of people die from a tsunami. Uh, there is no glee found in God when someone... Uh, in Iraq or um, Syria blows themselves up and takes plenty of people with them. Don't think that God's an unemotional God. He takes no glee in these things. He doesn't value it. He doesn't like it. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Jonah struggled with this. Do you remember that? What was Jonah's problem? And why did he run? What's that? He didn't, he didn't want to save the Ninevites. Correct. Yeah. How did that relate to God's love, do you think? Yeah. He wanted justice. He, he would be satisfied in the death of the wicked, wouldn't he? Jonah was satisfied in the death, not God. Um, plenty of chairs here, but whatever you'd like. <laughs> um, he was satisfied and therefore he ran. And God said, shall I not have compassion? Guys, feel free to just come straight through here if you'd like. Just plenty, whatever you like. All right. Um, 
Shall I not have compassion on them? Um, the compassion of God is seen in the good things in this world and the good things in life in the way in which God has provided. And we, we see this innately in the human heart, right? Because it's not only Christian organizations that do humanitarian work. Mostly, I would say, throughout history, it has been Christian organizations that do humanitarian work, but it's not only. Why is that? Because there's a common knowledge of our, in, in us, there's a common inbuilt image of God that shows love even to the wicked, even to those who harm us. Uh, we, don't, we don't seek their, um, uh, their demise. Um, God weeps and wails over the destruction of Moab, this wicked and wretched sinful Moab in Jeremiah 48. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Jerusalem are just about to crucify him. Jesus weeps and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you, but you would not. Jesus, showing compassion on the cross, says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is not love motivated by the present value of man because ultimately there is no value in man. Please understand that. This is not motivated because God has, sorry, man has intrinsic value. Remember, why was Benjamin chosen um, over, actually, I'll throw that, no, I'll throw that back into this one. Leave that. So just understand. So it's not like, oh, there's value in you, therefore I love you. No, 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 there's no value. God doesn't need to love us. He doesn't, it doesn't give him anything intrinsic back, but he loves us, humanity, because he chooses to love us. Um, okay, any questions on that? It's wonderful, isn't it? God's love demonstrated in warning, right? So we have, it's sort of this process, his grace, common grace, his pity on all of us, his warning, where do we see this? Remember in Luke 13, the disciples are walking along and they're, they're, they're questioning, uh, why have certain things happened? Why have certain things happened upon, it would seem to be, innocent people? And Jesus makes a really interesting comment, and you can turn there if you want, Luke 13. And he says, um, well, I'll read it, verse 1. Uh, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. A very a terrible thing. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? What they're trying to do is find a reason for such grotesque and wrong suffering. And Jesus says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So he says, actually, what happened to these men by the hands of Pilate, how terrible it was, was a warning to all of you that that could happen to you, lest you repent. And then it goes on. Or those 18 of whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? You might think, well, what about you know, uh, natural law uh, when these things naturally happen? We had the bushfires. We've got now the, um, the, the floods up north. Don't see this as just haphazard happenings by God or, or just without God's hand. Because then he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So what we see is that these things, whether it be floods, bushfires, uh, towers falling on people, indiscriminate killings, these are warnings for all of us to say our time is coming and we need to repent before God. It's not that they're worse than you. It could have been you who were killed by Pilate. It could have been you who were um, the, the Tower of Siloam fell. And so while we might get a whole warning system, a tsunami warning system, so that we protect our physical bodies when a tsunami hits. What these natural disasters are for us is an internal spiritual warning system, an alarm saying, 
repent, repent. And I want you to see it. That is an aspect of God's love, not something bad. And it's, it's interesting. Well, you know, we say, well, why do babies go, die? Why does this happen? We, ne- we, we say, God must be hateful if he let, lets that happen. Well, it's actually a, an, an aspect of his love that he's warning us lest we go into eternal damnation without him. Any questions on that? So when someone says, why are these natural disasters happening? Next time you could say, well, it's actually a loving God. Allowing them to happen so that we would not go into the eternal fires of hell, away from his love and kindness. Hmm. Okay, Um, love seen in the offer of the gospel is the last one here. Love seen in the offer of the gospel. It says, uh, Jesus gave the command, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Take it to the ends of the earth. Don't discriminate. Don't look and say, those ones don't need it. They don't deserve it. Um, Whatever it be, don't be like uh, the people who said to William Carey, who said, I want to go to India. And the guy said, young man, sit down. If God wants to save the heathen, he'll do it himself. No, he uses us to save the heathen, and we are all heathen. Um, But what we have here is his love scene in the scattering the gospel. It's not saying, well, no, you are the elect. You'll be chosen. Therefore, I'll tell it to you, but I won't tell it to you. No, no, it's just simply the gospel is the gospel that proclaims Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have an everlasting life. That is the open declaration of the gospel. Now, who God chooses to save and how that happens, uh, that we'll get, we'll get here. But ultimately, God, Jesus died for all people to the extent that all people have opportunity to hear and respond. Make sense? Any questions on that? So based on that, we can say God loves you? Correct. Based on that, you can say God died for you, Jesus died for you. But again, you've got to, be, you've got to clarify that. You do have to clarify that. Um, because people will think, well, great, I can snub my nose at God. I can keep in my sin. God loves me. It's like he is compelled to love me. That's just his nature. He can't do otherwise. So so we can say, well, what what are the caveats? If I said God loves you, am I right in that? And how am I right and how am I wrong? So maybe just, Edmund, do you want to help us? Mm. You need to explain the severity of sin as well. Bring, back, bring them back to the holiness of God as well. Mm. Like, mm. Yep. Yeah. That's good because we've got we've to balance that with God is not pleased with the wicked. So, good. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? With how sh- can we tell someone God loves them rightly without them having a wrong perception? How do we clarify that? That's good. Yes. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins so that you have the opportunity of eternal life. Yeah, that's good. That you have capacity to take that. It's there for you if you would have it. I want them to think he loves you. Oh, I can just keep doing what I'm doing like you said before. No. I remember we looked at the wrath of God last week and, and I think we need to think in that order. God is very angry at sin and you and me for sinning if I'm outside of Christ. We've got to state that because otherwise the love will mean nothing. It just means nothing. Oh, you know, my grandma loves me. Do I care? (laughs) You should care. (laughs) And you should care that God loves you because you're a rotten sinner. And we all are. You know what I'm saying? So we've got to tell them the bad news before we get to the good news or they will just yawn at the good news. And that's why Paul says, I am under a mandate to preach the gospel. I need to preach the gospel. I need to get this, this news out. I want everyone to know. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. All right, let's keep moving. 
So we've looked at God's love for himself, this Trinitarian love that allows him now to extend that love. It's a natural thing. Um, that is why we are, we're created, created in his image. Uh, love wants to give and give. That shows forth in humanity. And just, let me, truly, I'll lock these things away. How does he love all people? So when you say God loves you because he, he gives you rain, he gives you a job, God loves you because he shows pity on you. He wants you to um, come to him. He, he warns you of this and the, the gospel is the evidence of this. So just outline it. Okay, but what about God's love specifically for his people? Um, it is an infinite, infinite, infinite love. Um, John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only. This is uh, Jesus' priestly prayer in the upper room, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And then he clarifies these. And it's a beautiful statement. You sent me and loved them. Now, what he's talking about here, he's been very specific. This is not humanity, right? Because he's saying, I'm speaking to those who will believe in me through your word. Verse 20, then he clarifies that. You sent me and loved them even as you've loved me. Now, just think about this, guys. This is remarkable. And both are in the, 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 the same word for loved, both in the same tense. So the love that the father has for the son, it's in the aorist tense that looks right back, an infinite love. He says, just as you've loved me, stretching back before all time, you have loved them. That's remarkable. God foreknew, foreshose those who would believe in him. Do you notice that from that verse? From eternity, this is, is an infinite love. It's limitless. It should blow our mind. A Christian should never have an inferiority complex. No one loves me. What? God loves you. And he's proven this. Jesus says this. You don't need any other love apart from this. Every other love is a blessing out of this. But this is the greatest. And it should humble us as well. Infinite love, that love that was bestowed on Christ has been bestowed on us. That's pretty good. Any thoughts? Questions? This is the sort of love you can tell your children about. Yeah, please. Yeah. How to feel his love. How to feel his I mean, some people feel this word is quite empty, the love sense, but realistically how I can get it. Yeah. No, that good Vivian. How do you receive his love? Or how do you know experientially that he loves me? Anyone want to help? Great question. Great question. Okay, how do I feel this? How do I, how do I experience this? Help, help us here. You've just, you've stumped them. You've stumped them. They've got nothing to say. So I see in Christ, he died for us for the sin of sinners. Just reading about what happened on the cross and what he had to endure. Yeah. Living a perfect life. And, and I think, I think that's the key, right? Um, Love is not a feeling, ultimately. Our reception of God's love is going to be by faith. Right? When, I, when I read this here, that the, the very love that was on Jesus is now on me if I believe in him. That is like the father trying to say, Vivian, I love you. There's, my, there's the evidence. Edmund, I love you. There's the evidence. Out of that, as we grab, grab that by faith and make it real to us, 
There is a, the, yes, feelings can flow from that, but they, it's got to be based on objective evidence, in a sense. It's no use the um, a, a husband saying to his um, wife, I love you, and the objective evidence is, no, you don't. <laughs> you forget my birthday, you don't care about me, it's all about you. You know what I mean? He's objectively shown us he loves us. And as we meditate on that and, and revel in that, we'll go, whoa. And really then receive it by faith. And I think then the Holy Spirit does come. And for some, it's, it's, it's going to be tears of joy and um, very evident. It's, for others, it's not. Um, and, uh, and we want a greater capacity uh, to to comprehend this. And you can't live a life outside the scriptures and comprehend this because it's just going to be a superficial knowledge of God's love. It doesn't mean anything, but I've got to, it's, this is called a love story of his redemptive work for me. Um, so don't, don't go on, I don't feel loved. If my daughter said, I don't feel loved by your dad, what more do I need to do? Like, see my love for you. And that's what we have here. So just be careful. You're not basing God's love for you on whether I feel it or not. I'm a wretched sinner and quite often I don't feel it. Um, so that would just be, hope that's helpful. Um, let's keep going. And this gets to our next uh, point and backs up just what we've really been saying. Um, sacrificial. I spelled that right. Sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. Uh, true love sacrifices. True love gives. True love costs. And that's the very thing we've been saying. It will sacrifice, give them food and clothes on their back. That's what God does. God loves us. He gives us things. Uh, he gives us himself. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Very thing we're saying that Edmund said. How do I know God loves me? The cross. The cr cross shows us. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, because the, the son is co-equal with God, the father, then God gave God. Comprehend that. And then the second aspect of that quote that I don't think I added in your notes there, God could, God could know could give no greater gift than for God to give God as a demonstration of his sacrificial love for you and me. Um, husbands, uh, Ephesians 5.25, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did he display his love? By giving himself up for her. We are to love by giving ourselves up, husbands to wives. It's not about me, it's about my wife, it's about her uh, best interests. Lay down my life for you. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It is a sacrificial love that really did cost him. So we have, it is an infinite love that stretches back before all time. It is presented in the sacrifice in time and space in Jesus dying. On the cross. So this is very specific now, right? God's love for his people. He died generally, Jesus died generally as a open proclamation that all who come, come. That's what we do. We preach the gospel. The feet of that person who preached the gospel is really good. They're beautiful. General. But then specifically, we find that when Jesus died, he actually achieved something. He died for the atonement of his own people. So we'll never say that there's people in hell that God died for, that Jesus died specifically for. He didn't atone for people's sins in hell. He specifically atoned for his people. So when Jesus is going to the cross, he's not standing there thinking, man, I really hope someone believes in me. Or otherwise, this is, <laughs> this is not going to really be good and useful. Um, he goes as an open proclamation... As the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, so he will draw all men. 
but he goes specifically, so two aspects specifically, to die and atone for and to buy, redeem uh, the, his own people, his sheep, his church, says Ephesians. Any questions there? All right, and I've got to move because I've got five minutes. God's love is volitional. Volitional. Meaning it is voluntary. It is his choice. He loves us. There is nothing loving in us. Israel, uh, you see this in Deuteronomy 7, 7, 8. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you or chose you for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you. And, he's, and he is keeping the oath that he swore to his fathers. You'd, it's not because there's anything innately good in you. There's nothing, just as Benjamin was not chosen as the chosen is, uh, race or, um, or tribe. It is because God is simply loving and chooses to bestow upon people his love as he chooses. Martin Luther, God did not love us because we are more valuable. We are valuable because he loves us. 1 John 4, 10, in this is loved, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He is the initiator. He is the pursuer. And he is the one who set his heart upon us, pursued us, and would not take no for an answer. He brought, he redeemed he completed the task while we were still dead in our sins. God's love is eternal. Lastly, it is not a love for a moment, a season to quickly disappear or soon pass away. To see the beginning of this love, we will have to fly back to all eternity. We'll see it then in the cross presented and then we will see it as we are with him in eternal paradise with him. John 6, 37, all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. 39, for this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. I love that. The father takes his people, gives them to the son. Son, they're yours. This is the prize of your cross. I loved you with an everlasting love, uh, Jeremiah 31, 3 says. So what do we have? God's love for himself. He can never love us if he doesn't love himself in Trinity. Um, and that love is sacrificial. It's not man. A selfish love loves himself. Just remember, he's in Trinity. He's not single. God's love for humanity is seen in general sense. His love for his people is seen in a very specific sense. And so when I look at that, I think, wow. God is love, and this is now starting to round out what that truly means. Any questions before I make my last comment regarding the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards and just some points? So how are you going to cultivate a love for him? Right? How are you going to live in such a way that that honors him and proclaims his love for me and uh, shows the transformation he has done in my life. I've just got a list of things at the back of your, um, your notes there. And I'll just, I'll leave the actual verses for you to read, but we must forsake sin. Blessed is the pure in heart for they shall see God. They shall know God, sorry. Forsake sin. Sin should not have a place in our lives. We have been transformed. We are born again. We're a new people in Christ. Doesn't mean we don't sin. We say with David, create in me a new heart, O God, and, um, and renew a right spirit in me. We must be totally committed to Christ. No strings attached. He is Lord and Master. He is Savior. He is my God, and I pursue him. Yes, I only do it in his grace, and I seek him. We must reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Sin does not define me anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ. The old has passed away. The new has come. Consider ourselves dead to sin. We must renounce the cheap values of the world. 
Colossians 3 there, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth and meditate on the majesty of Christ. Blessed is the one who has turned his back on the world and sets his sights on God, Psalm 1. And once we begin to know him, we will be delighted to serve him and others. Hence why once you love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, you are called to love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. You cannot do the latter if you do not do the former. How do we achieve this? We want to cultivate a love for the Lord. We want to cultivate that through his word. Jonathan Edwards at the age of 17 thought, I want to know God more and more. I want to cultivate this relationship with the, with the Lord. At the age of 17, uh, he wrote 70 resolutions. You might have heard these uh, between 1722 and 1723. They are remarkable. And you might say, well, isn't this legalism to do these things? No, it's cultivating spiritual disciplines. It's, it's basically, there's nothing legalistic about trying to um, hold on to the vine to be in Christ, to rest in Christ, not to look at the fruit, let the fruit take care of itself, but to know him and love him. And these resolutions are set forth for that purpose, that he would be resolved to put away sin, to assess his own life and to seek the good of God and the good of others. Any questions as we close this uh, term study of recapturing a knowledge of God? Any comments, questions? That just might be a comment on I think what you asked on experiencing mm. the love of God. Um, a friend of mine is 78 years old. He's battling cancer for eight years. He picked up COVID. He was in the ICU <coughs> unit in hospital. And I text him and I say, Hercules, how are you? He responded back. He said, I'm looking out of the window on the grass. There's a daddy playing with his four-year-old girl with a rubber ball and beautiful garden. He said, the flowers are all blooming. He said, what a wonderful God we have. <laughs> creation. Mm. Nothing about what he feel. Three days later, he was released from hospital. <laughs> Unexpectedly. Wow. So I think that is experiencing God yeah. in trials and tribulation. Mm. And he doesn't come up, some, maybe, with a sign or something, but that is a sign. But that is, a, yeah, absolutely. And it's only when he was in that state that he had eyes to see. But, yeah, great, great example. Thank you. Thank and you. I also think that it's also the fact that you're here. <laughs> yes. want to know more about God. Because he says in a word, in a word that, he draws us with his love, mm. you know, so you've obviously been drawn to him. So you've accepted, you know, it coming in. So it's also as well. You know. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good thoughts, guys. Well, I'm out of time, um, but it's been a good class. I hope you've been blessed and um, hope you've been encouraged as you progress forward into Easter and uh, this coming uh, Sunday coming up. But may this whole service be a blessing to you as we go and worship the Lord in a moment. So let us, let us pray. Lord, give us eyes to see your beauty, uh, your goodness to us in just the general things of life, even as has been spoken of here, the, the flowers and the sun and the grass, and even the very fact that we are here under your word uh, to hear and to nurture this spirit that we have in us. Uh, that we would grow in our knowledge of you. I pray for each one here and I pray for those who are not here that we would grow in the Lord, uh, that our lives would be um, changed and transformed by the knowledge of Christ uh, for your sake, grown in holiness uh, and looking to see the gospel spread from us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.